Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Jessica. I am the Planetarium Director. Um, and with me, I've got two of my students, Lindsay and Eli, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, Lindsay, if you want to start. Hi, I'm Lindsay. I'm a physics graduate student at UMD. Hi, I'm Eli. I'm a physics undergrad student at UMD. So um, today, uh, Lindsay's going to be doing our show and telling us all about how physics is used by animals, um, which is really cool, and I'm super excited for this. Um, Eli is going to be watching the comments. If you have any questions, put them in the comments, and um, we will get to them as soon as we can. If we don't get to it right away, um, don't panic. We are going to take some time at the end of the show and make sure that we answer any questions that are there. Um, but with that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Lindsay. All right. All right. So I'm super excited about this show. I love showing people where we can see physics, um, not just, you know, in physics labs and um, things like that, but and just out in the animal kingdom. And so today uh, we're gonna be looking at how different animals are using physics uh, out in the animal kingdom. So first, um, we're gonna look at color. So actually light and color is my personal favorite physics topic. And before we look at color in different animals, we need to understand just what color is. Um, so on the left here, uh, we have white light um, coming into a glass prism. Um, and you can see that it gets separated into all of the colors of the rainbow. Um, over here on the right is the actual picture of white light um, going through a glass prism and getting changed to all the colors of the rainbow. Um, and so this white light, um, again, made up of all the colors of the rainbow, sunlight is white light. Um, and then we can also see that when that white light hits the glass, um, the colors act differently. Um, and so um, that has to do with each color's wavelength and frequency, which I'm not gonna get a ton into. Um, but you can see that the different colors bend a different amount. So the red color bends the least amount as it goes into the glass prism and the violet color bends the most amount as it goes into the glass prism. All right, so now how does it work that we see colors on objects? So this is a plant. And in this case, the plant has a pigment and that pigment is chlorophyll. So again, we have sunlight. And again, sunlight is white light, all of the different colors of the rainbow. And so what the pigment does is it absorbs all of the other colors besides green. And so green gets reflected up to your eye and that's why the leaf looks green. So sometimes when we see colors in the animal kingdom, it's because they have pigments. And so here is a bird, we've got the sun, uh, our white light coming in. Um, there's kind of two layers to the feather, the keratin layer, that's keratin is um, kind of the same stuff as our fingernails. Um, and then under that layer, there are pigment granules. So those pigment granules absorb all of the other colors um, except red. And then the red gets reflected back out at us. So we have this red bird. Uh, some other, other animals that have pigments that give them color. We have these polar bears, they're white. Um, since sunlight is white light, that means that all of the light that hits the polar bear uh, pigments get reflected back at us. Um, the black parts of the ladybug, um, they actually absorb all light. They don't reflect any of the light. And so that's why those parts of the ladybug look black, it's absorbing all the light. 
Uh, that's also why when you're outside and you're wearing a black t-shirt on a hot day, it gets super hot because the black is absorbing all of that sunlight. Uh, and then we've got our yellow frog over here that is um, having a pigment that absorbs all of the colors of the rainbow except for yellow and that's reflecting yellow back at us. Uh, another way that color can happen in the animal kingdom is based on structure. So we're going to look at this prism um, diagram again. So again, these different colors, they behave differently when they hit the glass. Um, the red bends differently than the orange, than the yellow, than the green, and so on. And so over here we have an oil slick and you can see the different colors. And so that happens because we have um, different um, depths to the oil slick. And so depending on the particular depth of um, that particular part of the oil slick, like this one right here is kind of bluish. And so this, the depth of the oil slick right here uh, lends itself to reflecting the blue light back at us. Um, over here, um, the reddish part of the oil slick, um, that happens to be a particular depth that happens to reflect the red light back at us. Um, also, uh, the colors can change depending on how you're looking at the oil slick. So uh, one way that we see color from structure in nature is animals that are iridescent. Uh, so we have um, in these feathers, again, the keratin layer, like our fingernails, um, a layer of melanin, and then um, another layer of keratin and melanin. So we have white light coming in from the sun. And then when that hits these um, melanin uh, rods, that light gets scattered. And depending on how you view um, the feather or the bird, um, you can see it as different colors. Uh, this is a snake called a sunbeam snake, and you can see that it looks just like an oil slick. So um, we have this bird that can be iridescent um, with this particular structure, but um, other animals without feathers can be iridescent also. Um, that outer layer of the skin um, can act like this keratin layer um, in the bird. So another way we get color from structure is blue. <laughs> so usually blue pigment is very, very rare in the animal kingdom. And so when you see a blue animal out there, it's usually not because it has blue pigment in its feathers, for instance, with this bird. It actually has to do with the structure. So again, we have our keratin layer. And then we have a, a mix of keratin and air in this spongy layer. And the organization of these um, particles in this spongy layer are just exactly so, so that all of the colors from the sun get scattered away and the blue gets scattered back at us. Um, here are some more. So here is the blue morpho butterfly. Again, there's no blue pigments in this butterfly. Um, the light is coming in and going through that structure that we just looked at and the blue is getting scattered back at us. Um, so in fact, with this particular type of color that animals have, uh, if there was no light, um, then the animal actually wouldn't have any color. So because they're getting their color from um, the sun's light interacting with their kind of spongy layer, um, they would not have any color if they were um, not in a, in a lighted area. This also happens in humans. <laughs> so uh, brown eyed people, they actually have brown pigments in their eyes and their irises, uh, but green eyed people and blue eyed people do not. There's no green pigments, there's no blue pigments. The structure of your iris, if you have green eyes or blue eyes, is just such that when the light hits your iris, um, it makes your eyes look green or blue. 
pretty cool. Um, so another way that uh, animals can produce color is through UV radiation and what they do with that. Um, some of them can fluoresce. So you have the sun that has UV rays coming from it um, or black lights. If you've been to our actual planetarium, um, we have black lights there. Um, and you can know that they kind of light up um, some of the paintings around the planetarium. Um, and so we have UV light coming in. Um, absorption by some material, and then a lower energy light wave being emitted by that material. So one animal that fluoresces is coral. And it is believed that the coral has this chemical in it that makes it fluoresce um, to kind of act like a sunblock. So the UV rays come from the sun um, and hit that a layer of the chemical on um, the coral, and that chemical absorbs the UV radiation and then re-emits the light at a safer wavelength. So uh, really quick, uh, before we go on, we got a question from, or more of a kind of comment query from Will Tony. Um, it seems like polar bears would have evolved to absorb light wavelengths instead of reflecting all of them to keep them warmer. Um, I don't know what you think. I, I, when I read that, my first thought was um, they might have evolved to do that so that they would blend in with snow and ice better um, in case you know, there was any predation going on. What do you think, Lindsay? Yeah, that I think it has more to do with blending in. Um, that's actually one of the reasons that um, blue animals may have evolved. Um, as we got kind of more blue flowers and blue fruits and things like that, um, they evolved to become blue to kind of blend in with those things. Maybe like the blue sky too, if something was watching them from below. Yeah. All right, so scorpions also fluoresce and um, there's kind of two things that this could do for the scorpion. Um, again, just like with the coral, we're not 100% sure. Um, if this is the reason that it, it fluoresces. So just like with the coral, the scorpion has a chemical in it and um, the UV radiation gets absorbed by that chemical and then re-emits light um, so that the scorpion fluoresces. So that chemical, again, could be acting like a sunblock in the scorpion. Um, it also, another idea is that the scorpion has a bunch of light receptors all throughout its body, and it has very poor eyesight. So when it's trying to hide from predators, um, it has such poor eyesight that it can't tell if its entire body is in shade or protected or not. And so it is thought that um, this chemical that absorbs the UD UV radiation somehow sends signals to the scorpion that lets it know what parts of its body um, are still being in, uh, exposed to the sunlight um, and which parts of the scorpion are in the shade um, so that it can be fully protected. Uh, and then there is bioluminescence. Uh, so this particular animal um, is called a firefly squid. And depending on the animal, um, there could be different chemicals in them that are making them um, biofluoresce. It's thought that actually three quarters of all ocean life uh, have bioluminescence. So that's a lot. So there's a chemical reaction um, in the cells that make a flash. Um, it usually is with the chemical uh, luciferin. Um, and then whatever other chemical is in the particular organism, um, those two chemicals will react and then make light. Um, and bioluminescence uh, has a few different reasons that it could be helpful for the animal. So um, it could startle something that is approaching the animal, um, misdirect it, um, be distractive. Um, if you've seen Finding Nemo, um, Nemo and Dory get distracted by a fish that is bioluminescing. <laughs> and then it could be uh, an alarm. Some other things that it could do is lure prey, um, stun or confuse prey, um, illuminate prey. Of course, when we get way down into the ocean, we get to depths where sunlight can't even reach. 
Um, and um, of course, also there's nighttime where we don't have the sunlight, so they need some way to be able to see. Um, and then finally, some organisms bioluminesce because they are trying to attract a mate. All right. The next topic I'm going to talk about is called magnetoreception. And this has to do with animals that actually are receptive or can detect Earth's magnetic field, which is pretty awesome. Uh, one of those is sea turtles. So I'm going to play this video here that's going to show you kind of how that works, how they use the magnetic field to navigate. Imagine waking up on the beach before dawn. The glimmer of light leads you to the shoreline. Suddenly, a wave pulls you in. At first, you use the direction of the waves to guide you. But once you're in the open sea, with powerful currents bombarding you, and very little light, how can you be sure of where you are and where you're going? For a hatchling sea turtle, the answer is magnetoreception. That's the ability to sense magnetic fields. We know many animals use this sixth sense for navigation. What we don't know is exactly how magnetoreception works. Here's what we do know. Earth itself is like a giant magnet. The motion from its liquid outer core generates a magnetic field. Certain animals can sense this field and use it as a compass to tell them if they're heading in the right direction, a map to give them signposts along the way. There's two competing theories for how magnetoreception works. One is a chemical sensor, the other is, is a mechanical sensor. The first theory is that animals have tiny magnetite particles in their bodies that act as magnetic receptors. Magnetite is the most magnetic natural metal on Earth. It's been found in many animals that exhibit magnetoreception. And it's thought that it's the only potential sensor that would be sensitive enough to capture these incredibly tiny variations in magnetic field strength that would allow the animal to, to not just know whether they're going north or south along the magnetic field line, but know the precise beach that they need to get to. The other theory is that animals possess a protein in their eyes called cryptochrome, which allows them to see magnetic fields. Cryptochrome has been found in the eyes of several migratory birds, but we haven't proven either theory for a few reasons. With magnetoreception, you don't know where to look. Magnetic fields pass invisibly through the entire body, so researchers don't know exactly where these magnetite particles or cryptochromes would be attached to particular cells, I and mean, so mistakes are made all the time. And so far, cryptochrome experiments have only yielded positive results in the presence of magnetic fields much stronger than Earth's. The frontier is now so not so much at the animal behavior level, but actually getting inside the brains of these animals and trying to find uh, these sensing cells and connecting them to the neural circuitry. It's not so much a question of, of which animals have this sense, but which don't. So researchers have said, well, why not humans? Maybe we had this sense at one point deep in our evolutionary past and, and lost it, but maybe there's a vestige left. Researchers in California and, and Japan have gone after this, this holy grail one more time uh, with a very specialized experiment, one that relies on double blinding and uh, magnetic shielding. And they're seeing glimmers, maybe even more than glimmers, of this magnetic sense in humans. It's starting to be reproducible and they're really excited about it. Awesome. So some other animals that um, are magnetoreceptive, uh, we've got the Mammian uh, naked mole rat over here on the left, um, honeybees, and also um, homing pigeons. Um, and as you saw in the video, potentially humans, but we might have lost that skill. Um, another cool way that um, magnetic field detection is used is with foxes, and they actually use it to help them catch their prey. Winter in the Yellowstone National Park. The snow here is regularly more than two meters deep. A red fox can survive here all winter, but only 
if it can find enough food. Their ability to pinpoint rodents beneath the thick layer of snow has always been attributed to their exceptional hearing. And that is part of the process. Foxes can move each ear independently, rotating them up to 150 degrees. More than a dozen separate muscles finely tune the position of the ear canal so the fox can identify a sound and locate it more accurately. But in 2010, scientists uncovered something astonishing. It's long been known that to reach the prey beneath the snow, or even in thick grass, foxes use a technique called a mouse pounce. What this recent survey found was that the overall hit rate was just 18%. But when the fox faced in a northeasterly direction, the hit rate rose to a staggering 73%. Unbelievably, the foxes seemed to be aligning their pounces to the Earth's magnetic field, which tilts downward in the northern hemisphere. It's thought that the fox can detect this magnetism. As the fox creeps forward, it listens for the sound of a mouse, searching for that sweet spot where the angle of the sound hitting its ears matches the slope of the Earth's magnetic field. When it finds that spot, the fox knows that the prey is a fixed distance away and it can calculate exactly how far to jump to land right on top of it. Scientists think that the secret behind this talent might be a protein in the fox's eye called cryptochrome, which is sensitive to the Earth's natural magnetism. What's more, they speculate that this might actually allow them to see the magnetic field as a patch in their vision. If the scientists are correct, the red fox would be the first animal known to use the Earth's magnetic field to hunt. I think that is just super cool. Um, so in addition to using the magnetic field to hunt, they also use physics in that they, um, you know, do that calculation of their projectile motion so that when they jump um, and try to land on their prey, they land right on it. Super cool. All right, some animals actually navigate using stars. Um, so this is called a wild-caught Indian bunting. And these birds migrate south and they were put in a planetarium actually. And it was found that in the planetarium, um, they still knew where the patterns for the Southern constellations were, um, even though they weren't outside at night. And so they actually used those star patterns in the Southern sky uh, to help them know if they are going south or not. Uh, the dung beetle, um, it likes to roll its ball in a straight line because um, it doesn't want to end up where it start, back where it started. Um, so it looks for um, the brightest part of the night sky, usually the Milky Way, um, and it uses that to help it keep going uh, in the same direction. Uh, there are also some animals that can walk on water. Uh, and this is because of water tension. Um, so water molecules um, are kind of all attracted to each other um, and that causes kind of this uh, curved shape. Um, and so that's why when you have water on like a surface, um, like leaves, um, it is a full drop because of that surface tension is all around 
um, this uh, drop of water. So surface tension um, allows things like spiders to actually be able to walk on water. So the force that is being applied to the water by the spiders uh, isn't great enough to break that um, attractive force between those water molecules. Um, and so that is allowing the spider, um, along with some other bugs, uh, to be able to walk on water. All right, lastly, animals and sound. Probably the coolest application of animals and sound is, of course, echolocation. Think of a cat silently stalking a bird, or a rattlesnake ready to ambush a mouse without rustling a leaf on Lindsay, the sound disappeared because um, you yeah. muted yourself. Now consider okay. bats, whales, dolphins, porpoises, and a few other animals that you. Think of a cat silently stalking a bird or a rattlesnake ready to ambush a mouse without rustling a leaf on the forest floor. An owl can swoop down on a mouse without making a sound. Silence is the cloaking device predators use to capture a meal. Now consider bats, whales, dolphins, porpoises, and a few other animals that use their voices to find prey. Through echolocation, these animals emit sounds of different frequencies and loudness that bounce off the objects around them. The echoes are then captured by the ears and the brain figures out how to recognize food and navigate the surroundings from those signals. Some bats emit sound blasts that are so loud they could deafen human hearing we cannot hear their ultrasonic voices. The world would sound quite different if we could. Like whales and dolphins that use echolocation in water, bats use their voices to see the world through air and very effectively. A katydid rests motionless on a leaf, one of thousands of leaves on a tree. The insect doesn't make a peep. The night is black. A leaf-nosed bat flying nearby blasts the tree with sonar at ultrasound frequency, then listens. It sees the katydid with the echo created from sonar and swoops in for the kill. No human-made sonar equipment can detect objects with such finesse. In fact, the most sophisticated submarine sonar system, large as a house, cannot see the world nearly as well as a bat. Leaf-nosed bats are at the pinnacle of echolocating animals. Their fleshy noses are like musical instruments that amplify and focus the sounds made with their larynx. In fact, their noses change shape to produce different sounds for scanning different objects in the surroundings. Their ears are also capable of shape-shifting to capture the sensory information they need at any moment so they can fly in the dark without hitting tree limbs or power lines, communicate with each other, and pick an insect meal from dense vegetation with surgical precision. All right, uh, does anybody have any more questions? I'm not seeing anything in the uh, chat right now. All right. All right, well, let's, if you're okay with it, Lindsay, I'm gonna go back to our video view. Yep. 
Okay. All right. Well, that was so cool. There was a lot of stuff in there I didn't know. That was what awesome. What was your favorite? The fox. Yeah, the fox is just super cute. It's it's adorable and also just really awesome how it uses so many different things to be able to hunt and calculate where to go and how to jump. Like, that's just really cool. Um, so, yeah, if you do have any questions, um, now is a good time to leave them in the comments. Um, and while we wait, let me tell you a little bit about what's going to be coming up next week. Um, so starting next week, our live streams are moving to a new time. We're going to be on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 7 p.m., uh, moving to the evening so that um, people can you know, go out and enjoy the beautiful weather we've been having. Um, and so next Wednesday at 7, we're going to be doing a special show all about uh, space flight and how we get to space. Um, because earlier that day will be the launch of the Crew Dragon spacecraft, which is the first time in about nine years that astronauts have launched from American soil. Um, and the first time done so in coordination with a private company. Um, and so we're going to tell you kind of what it takes to get into space and give you some updates on this mission um, that launches that afternoon. And then on Saturday at 7 p.m., we're going to be doing a show all about aliens. Uh, I'm very excited for this. Uh, we're going to explore kind of what it might take for life to develop elsewhere, what we're kind of looking for when searching for life, and maybe what that life could look like. Um, and so we'll We'll do that on Saturday. Um, I'm excited. I've been wanting to do a show about this for a while. Um, so I'm kind of grateful that we get that opportunity now. Um, so yeah. Eli, anything coming in? Uh, nope. No? All right. Well, thank you, Lindsay, for an awesome show. Um, I loved that. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, we hope to see you next week um, at our shows then as well, again, moving to 7 p.m. As usual, um, if you want to go back and watch any show again or anything that you missed, uh, we do have all of these up on our YouTube channel, which is linked in the description for this video. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining us and we hope you have a great day. Um, bye everyone.